Hello, welcome to Razzle Cannabis Broadcasting Network. My name is Keiko, and I'm with the show A Season Perspective, a look at the culture, community, history of cannabis and how it affects patients all over the world. Today is an amazing show. We have one of my favorite, favorite people with us here today, and he is an activist, an icon, a master cultivator, and a very wonderful friend. I'm so blessed to have with us Ed Rosenthal with us here today, and we'll be with him shortly after a word from our wonderful sponsors. Aerobloom is a proprietary patent-pending aeroponic system that reliably achieves at least double the crop yield of hydroponic cultivation. Aerobloom also uses 40 to 90% less water than hydroponics or traditional farming practices and produces a higher quality harvest with one additional crop cycle per year. At over four pounds of AAA quality trimmed flower per light and one additional harvest per year, Aerobloom is the highest producing, most efficient cultivation system in the cannabis industry. To learn more about Aerobloom, please visit their website at aerobloom.com. And to learn more about their current investment opportunity, please visit the Razzle Investment Marketplace at razzle.com. Welcome back to A Season Perspective. Again, my name is Keiko here on Razzle Cannabis Broadcasting Network. I have with us here Ed Rosenthal, master cultivator, activist at heart, and a dear friend. Hi, Ed. How are you today? I'm fine. And yourself? Great. Well, now that I'm with you, I'm fine. How's the weather up in Piedmont? Oh, it's uh, a little unseasonably hot. Uh, it's in, in, in the uh, mid-80s now, and uh, but uh, it's very comfortable still. Wow. Well, I know that the next couple of days, it's going to be a big heat wave here in California, they estimated that Death Valley will be 125 degrees. Yeah. So I don't think any flowers will go very well out there, at least not the flowers that we like, right? So if any of you don't know who Ed Rosenthal is, Ed Rosenthal is an extremely prolific writer, and he actually was one of the first writers there with the High Times, uh, regarding cultivation, and he has a full library of amazing books that he's written over the years, and but he's been an activist and done so much to bring awareness to the industry about the plant, the people, the community, and having legal access to. So, Ed, for those of people who don't know who you are, just go give us a little bit about yourself. I'm a researcher and writer and uh, political activist. And uh, since, uh, uh, and I've been uh, working for, Mar I've been working for marijuana legalization for much too long. And I've also published some books which uh, help people, uh, several generations of people uh, cultivate marijuana. Ed, you are known for writing the Bible of Cultivation, How to Grow Marijuana by Ed Rosenthal. That is dog-eared in so many people's libraries uh, of a lot of friends I go to and business people. I mean, everybody has that book. How does it feel to know that you have inspired a legion of budding cultivators? Uh, it's very satisfying to feel that I helped with that. and. You know, my ult ultimate goal is um, for enough people to use marijuana that society has real radical change and uh, becomes a more just society and uh, a peaceful society. Here in the United States, uh, there hasn't been a day since the country has uh, declared independence that it hasn't had a military action. and. Uh, I'd like to see some a couple of hundred years of peace instead of this uh, warlike state. Well, right now, marijuana with the COVID, might do it, change people's yeah. minds. Well, I know right now with the pandemic, cannabis has certainly been able to help a lot of people, you know, get through this isolation and 
and lockdown. I mean, how has it been for you and Jane there up in Piedmont at this time? Well, uh, we're pretty lucky because we live in a, a large house and we have uh, a front, private front yard and backyard. So it hasn't, you know, it hasn't uh, weighed down on us as it has for a lot of people who have much uh, smaller quarters to quarantine in. But we're, we're, we take the quarantine really seriously because we're in a vulnerable group. Yeah, I, and I know that you, it's going to be, e it's easy for you right now because you are actually working on a brand new book. Can you tell us a little bit about your new writing venture? Yes, it, it's a new edition of Marijuana Growers Handbook. And this time I'm writing, um, I have a co-author, Rob Flaherty, who has a PhD in horticultural endeavors and he uh, also is uh, has a marijuana farm and uh, and we have en enlisted the aid of um, uh, researchers professors and growers from all over the country to help us with each section of the book so again you're the book you're writing right now you've reached out to a lot of people in the industry, so they're giving you some their specialty tips. And I think you told me somebody special is uh, writing the forward to the book. Oh, yes. Um, for the second time, Tommy Chong volunteered to uh, write the, the introduction, the preface, and so he did. And it's, I mean, uh, it was very personal, and uh, I thought it was very especially for me it was very moving so i really appreciate I, what he did i love it and, and when and, will uh, the book be sorry when will the book, the book be, will be uh, out, out yeah we'll be out in uh sometime between june and september of next year and um it's uh uh it's it's a different kind of work than you than we've seen in marijuana cultivation books up to now and it takes it to a different de different degree and it, uh, of course we left the jargon behind so it's understandable by anybody whether they're a beginner or uh, experienced and but we have a lot of the we have a lot of information that beginners will uh, gloss over because they don't understand it yet, but that will be valuable to people who have been growing for a while. And then um, it's sort of like using a, uh, an instruction booklet for an something like a camera. So you read the instruction booklet and you barely figure out how to turn the camera on and take a few pictures. And then after using the camera for a few months, you go back to the instruction booklet and it has a whole new wealth of understanding that you can use. And this book is like that. It will get you started. And then once, once uh, you have an introduction, you can you go back and take another crack at it and it will give you so much more information. And I and believe you told I'm me that. I'm actually learning things um, as, as we're writing. Excuse me? Oh, I was going to I'm say sorry? the title of the new book is, is it How to Grow Cannabis? It's called Cannabis, the Cannabis Grower's Handbook. And okay. up to now, we called the book Marijuana Grower's Handbook, but there's been a change in style, so we're going with cannabis. Right, because I think a lot of people look at so, the term marijuana handbook. as the slang term. And cannabis is the proper term of it. And we've all come a long ways from 30, 40 years ago. What was it like in the beginning when you were writing for High Times at that time, maybe 30 years ago? Because that was the first real publication that was out there uh, uh, on the mainstream uh, yes. book racks. Right. Well, I wrote for it for... Uh for quite a few years and uh, my, my relationship with it started at the very beginning of the magazine 
but I was not in the office. You know, there was, um, when you speak with people who worked at High Times, they have all kinds of stories to tell, whether harrowing, funny, poignant, sad, everybody has a story. But I, I was on the West Coast and the magazine was on the East Coast. So what they got from me was articles and they rarely got to see me. And when I did come into New York, of course, I, I'd visit and they, they had this uh, um, uh, rule that there was no smoking on the premises. But you know, when I was there, nobody ever told me that. I uh -huh. found that out later, that people weren't allowed to smoke. But when I came in, I, if I lit a joint, nobody, you know, Matt, nobody would say anything. Management wouldn't. I, I'd be in the in my in a little office that they I'd borrow, and I'd be typing away, and you know, working, smoking joints. Nobody, people would come in, smoke joints with me, and, but. Smoking was not allowed. <laughs> no, well, but nobody ever said. Who's going to tell you? Nobody ever told me that. Yeah. Well, nobody who's ever said tell you not put to put out the joint? <laughs> Those were the days. I, I don't mean, know. You you have uh, traveled and been asked to speak at so many different conferences, seminars, and. And when you're there, you're like the Pied Piper. Everybody just gathers around you and wants to meet you, smoke with you, give you some hash. I mean, uh, that's quite an experience. And I, I always, when I would see that happen, I would feel for you because I didn't want you to be inundated. Uh, but you seem to enjoy it at times, too. What's that experience like? Well, it's very affirming. And, uh, everybody li lo likes to be loved. And, uh, you know, people were showing, you know, really, really positive feelings towards me. It's always nice to be the recipient of that. And, um, you know, I didn't go to, you know, you'd see me at uh, different conferences, but I didn't go to that many conferences that it was a weekly thing or something, and it got boring. I mean, I, I only went to maybe six or seven a year, so it wasn't overwhelming. But also, all you get um, asked to be consult for people who are cultivating. So you've actually traveled around the world. Um, teaching people or helping them with their now commercial grows. Uh, what's the most interesting experience you've had in working with people who've hired you to consult with? Uh, the, the, most inter the weirdest, most interesting was uh, I was hired to go to Australia. And it was at the time of the Nimbin uh, festival in Australia, the Mardi Gras festival. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went to the festival and pe persons, the people who hired me, who had paid my way, said that they'd get in touch with me at the festival. And it was the end of the festival and this fellow in really sort of hippie clothes, but like sort of looking a little down and out, came up to me and told me to come with him. And so we, we uh, left town, you know, the festival was over, we left town, we were driving in his car, he stops at a uh, gas station, ta takes a bag, goes into the gas station and um, change, changes, you know, in the bathroom into normal clothes. And then um, we continue. And then he took me to his garden in the outback that was, they built, they had built a reservoir and an irrigation system and had a couple, few acres growing in the outback. And, you know, they had a problem which I helped them solve. And then um, two weeks, and then I left Australia, and two weeks later, um, he, 
this fellow, I mean, it was really unusual to see something like that in the outback because it's very dry and then you get to this verdant field and two, and uh, Australia has this rule that they have these alcohol stops and they'll also swab the inside of the windshield to see if there's a mar marijuana residue there. And if there is, they feel they, the government says they have the right to search your car. So that happened to him, not when I was there, after, way after I had left. And they searched his car and they didn't find anything, but there was a computer there. And they opened up the computer, turned the computer on, and what did it go to? But pictures of a marijuana field. But they had no idea where the marijuana field was. So they actually broadcast pictures of the fellow and the, and the field. And he, he was kind of an or, ornery guy, even more ornery than I am. And no, he, that um, can't be. So we got along, but although we got along fine, I, I don't know why people, but anyway, he was kind of ornery. And he told me as we're driving along, getting equipment that he, the, the, uh, the ingredients that he needed for his fertilizer, he tell, told me, he said to his neighbor when he moved there, that his neighbor offered, he said, come on over bloke, let's have a beer together. And he says, well, I don't drink beer, but if I did it, I wouldn't drink it with a bloke like you. And that was his relationship with his neighbors. And he, the other neighbor, he had, uh, he was fighting over a hundred square feet of property or something like that. So nobody liked him. So when they published his picture, of course he was turned in. Now, if he had been a nicer guy with these people, they would have probably come over and said to him, uh, you have a few pounds for me? <laughs> you know, rather than turning them in. But, but that is the weirdest uh, month uh, that, that I ever had. And I was with his son in, in Holland when this happened. And his wow. son tried to get money out of a, a cash machine and all the account, his accounts had been frozen. So oh. I, so I was experiencing it with him. Oh, yeah, I have something to show you. Okay. Oh, you should wear it in your hair. Can you put it behind your ear, Ed? <laughs> or yeah, have Jane wear it in her, in her hair. Jane is Ed's lovely wife. Um, I know that um, right now, with everything changed, uh, you, you're definitely not going to these different events or doing any consulting. So, but you're still staying pretty busy with the new book. Um, when the COVID uh, pandemic lifts and maybe you'd be going out someplace, is there any place that you'd like to travel to at this time? I know that you uh, last year went to India. And that was a really great trip for you and Jane. Yeah, a, cu a couple of years ago, a few years ago, um, and we've also been to Morocco. And um, uh, yeah, India is a really incredible place. Uh, you know, right now I feel, I have mixed feelings about it because um, the people there voted in such a, um, uh, sect sectarian uh, uh, Hindu supremacist government. And so yes. the, the minor minorities there are suffering from that. So I have mixed feelings about that. And, and the ganja is grown, most of the ganja is grown in areas, in Muslim areas, and those people are being prosecuted, persecuted and prosecuted. Speaking of good ganja, you've been able to partake in smoking flour from all around the world, and I know it depends on who the cultivator is. Where have you smoked some of the best flour that you've ever had, or was it from your own garden? 
Well, you know, uh, anybody who's a grower can just look in the mirror and see who the best grower in the world is. <laughs> so, so, but, uh, but actually, um, among the best uh, marijuana that I ever smoked was uh, with uh, Neville Schumacher, who had the uh, seed bank many years ago, and he's now deceased. And um, as far, generally, as far as the best marijuana, um, I think that the um, various hot spots in uh, California, and um, especially in California, uh, are, have incredible and, material. Yes, I, I do think that Humboldt and the Trinity County area grows some of the best in the world. But the sad thing is, is that in the world right now, with all these different countries opening up and doing importing and exporting, Canada is saying that they grow the best in the world. And that's because people have access to it. What do you feel about um, how our legislation here is choking the access of good flower medicine that we grow here in the United States? I think it's short-sighted. I mean, this is, go this is a gigantic growth industry, and the fact that the government is thwarting it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that um, change is beginning to happen, and we'll see if there are differences. So, so do you think that this next presidential it, election could bring some of that change? It's better than it is change? 10 years ago, right? It's better oh, now gosh, than, it sure is. I'm sorry. It's better than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. So I think that, it might, but my concern is not, is not just about marijuana, but it's about um, this country and uh, the threat of uh, dictatorship uh, 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 of of Trump trying to impose a dictatorship here. I feel it's a real threat. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, to me, that's a more important than the marijuana laws even, because it, it threatens the very country that we, that we learned, you know, that we uh, have tried to uh, support for so long. The Wicked Roots mission is to unlock the healing power of cannabis and create trusted, safe, and highly effective wellness products. They firmly believe that cannabinoids and terpenes found in cannabis and hemp have the potential to positively impact millions of lives, and their team is dedicated to making this a reality. Utilizing proprietary DNA, the Wicked Root offers a brand of pharmaceutical-grade CBD products people can rely on. The Wicked Root team utilizes a full-spectrum CBD base infused with select terpenes to create optimal, science-backed formulas that are consistent and deliver targeted effects. To learn more about The Wicked Root, visit thewickedroot.com, or for more on their current investment opportunity, find Wicked Root in the Razzle Investment Marketplace at razzle.com. And, and you have been an activist, and I feel that more than anything, I'm an activist at heart myself. Uh, so you've seen the changes and the growth and the accessibility. I mean, I know for you, you were cited for growing cannabis in your own backyard many a few years ago, and you went through a lot of different trials and tribulations for that, and it ended out okay for you, but still, I really was pained when you had to go through that for just growing a few plants. And the thing was that well, you actually had that's approval. Okay, go. I wasn't growing a few plants. I was I was running a nursery that uh, was producing three to five thousand clones a week, and what those two to five thousand clones a week, and those clones were going to uh, the different dispensaries that were open at the time, and I was. Um, appointed as an officer of the city and yes. thought that everything that I was told by the city, yes, but so told by the city attorney that what I was doing was legal. So I was really surprised when I was arrested by the federal government because I, I, I thought that I, 
like I was on the legal side. So that was it. I mean, because they were clones and they weren't bud-producing plants at that time, that's why I think the city felt you were legal. But then no, it was no, the no. federal... The city made me legal so I could grow plants for patients. And they mm -hmm. did not specify what I would want to do. So I felt that just growing flowers would not be as helpful to patients as if I actually supplied them with patients and their supply, their suppliers with excellent clones from which they could grow excellent medicine. So, uh, so I would, the reason, and um, the, the government and the agents were very disappointed when they raided my place and didn't find any flowers. They were, they wanted to come out of the, oh, look at this, this is worth $50 million, you know, and all that. And all they were doing was carrying out these little trays of clones. You know, it, 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 it didn't make them happy, it made them look stupid, but they were stupid. They were stupid. You know, the, the federal government had already had experience with me because I had been a witness, witness in uh, uh, a expert witness in a number of trials. And so if they had checked their records, they could have seen the devastation that I had done to the prosecution in various cases. And they would have realized that, that uh, they weren't going to get a plea deal out of me or anything like that. And um, the, by the time it got to the uh, attorney, uh, this uh, federal attorney's office, they realized that this case was going full blast. And, uh, you know, they, they, got, they got the felonies, but the judge, you know, the judge was a little apparatchik, you know, like operator for the government. He was sort mm -hmm. of like the equivalent of the, the uh, I mean, I don't want to take this too far, but, you know, in a dictatorship, it requires the judges who are very unfair and who will always support the state, just like judges in Nazi Germany. And that's what he was. He was a little rapper chick who was just doing his duty to the state to arrest, get these people put in prison. And he uh, influenced the jury really unconstitutionally and Ill illegally. He stopped my attorneys from asking, um, from uh, cross-examining a cop who was going, about to be found to be a liar, either a liar or a dunce, one of the two. And, you know, there were any number of uh, things that happened at that trial. And by the t the government got their convictions, but they lost the case in, in that that trial changed the way America looked at medical marijuana because it was covered by the New York Times very favorably. I was on the front page. Okay, it was under the fold, but I was still, it was still the front page. So it was covered by the New York Times. It was unfair and why I shouldn't go to prison. And so, and then uh, my daughter was asked by the, uh, by the, um, by uh, reporters, well, what do you think of your dad? She was 11 at the time. And she said, my dad at the time, they, was say, they were saying, oh, if we made marijuana medical marijuana legal, it would send the wrong message to kids. You remember that campaign that they had those years ago? Just well, so she ended that campaign. Those eight words, those eight words knocked that campaign out. You never heard of that campaign ever again after she, they, they had these uh, commercials on that were paid for. And once those commercials were over, that was never part of the campaign again. She answered the question, whether it would send a bad message. No, the, you know, and so, uh, so uh, the other thing is that it, it showed that like, uh, to a great extent, when when uh, you push back to the federal government, they don't. It's not inevitable that you're going to be messed over. 
You know, so speaking of the federal government, speaking of the federal government, I have this vision and quest that I need want to see this descheduleized by the feds. Um, what do you think? Do you think we're going to be able to achieve that in the next few years? Well, you know, I don't think, well, you know, not with Trump, right? If Trump gets reelected, you know, we have bigger problems than, than uh, pot, you know, much, much bigger problems because we have a problem if he's reelected of preserving our republic. On the other hand, if, if uh, Biden is elected, although he personally, you know, he's really old school, he doesn't understand it. And, and I'll tell, tell you something about that in just a moment. But, uh, but uh, I think that the party and also our new vice presidential candidate is, is going to push legalization. And I think that it's going to be pushed, even though the party doesn't want to, it will be pushed during the campaign. And it will be, it will become a campaign issue. I do think so. And the thing is, if Biden comes out for, for, for marijuana, he's not going to lose any of his voters. He can only gain voters. Mm -hmm. if, if Trump came out, he would lose some of his voters. It's in Biden's interest to come out for it. And, and then, um, you know, uh, that uh, the party the vice president and the party are both going to be very uh, pro and start pushing pushing that. So I, th I think that the prospects are good if the Democrats win.